Hey everyone, welcome back to Pushing Film. So point and shoot film cameras can be a great option because they're portable, they're relatively cheap, easy to use, and they can still give you really high quality shots. But we can still benefit from some useful tips and there's a reason why the user manuals that often came with these had a lot of information in them. So first off, loading one of these is generally a lot easier than a manual advanced camera as I showed you in my other video called Beginner Tips for Loading Film, which I made quite some time ago. So I'm mainly talking about electronic point and shoot cameras that use a battery. But if you happen to have some kind of point and shoot that actually has an advanced wheel, then the method of loading film will be same as the manual advanced cameras shown in my other video. So you want to go and check that out. Generally, loading one of these point and shoot film cameras is simply a matter of opening the door, taking your roll of film, chucking it in, pulling out the leader to often a little mark somewhere next to the take up spool there and just closing the door and the camera should automatically advance the film to the first shot. So what happens if you've done this and the camera doesn't advance to the first shot? Maybe it has a flashing zero or empty or it stays on the start line on the counter there. So if you open up the camera, you'll often find that that means it hasn't loaded and the film is just sitting next to the take up spool. If that's the case, what I find is a good tip with point and shoot cameras is to simply pull a little bit more of the film out or maybe a little bit less. Even though there's often a little marker, sometimes an orange line that you need to pull the leader up towards, some of these things can wear out or they don't often work so well. So you might need to pull a fair bit more of the film out into the take up spool or sometimes back it off a little bit. Sometimes if the camera is really worn out and you've tried multiple times and you just can't get it to load up the film, that can be one of the common problems to happen with one of these. Otherwise, it might be worth trying a different roll of film. There's also some of these point and shoot cameras that will only work with DX coded film. So electronic cameras like this use that DX code on the back of the film to tell the camera what the ISO of the film is. And some really advanced point and shoot cameras actually let you override that and set the ISO yourself to something different than what the actual film speed is. This is useful if you like to overexpose your film, for example, or underexpose it so that you can push process it. On the other hand, some really limited point and shoot cameras didn't actually have DX code reading at all and you had to set the ISO yourself. You'll know if your point and shoot camera does read the DX code because it'll have the metal contacts inside the area where you load the film. So what if your point and shoot camera does read DX codes, but it doesn't let you change the ISO? You can still shoot that film at a different speed by hacking the DX code. All this really is, is changing the codes on the back of the film by either scratching out the black parts or using marker over the silver parts to change what the DX code tells the camera to do. In this way, for example, you can take a roll of HP5 400 and shoot it at 1600 and still push that roll of HP5 in your point and shoot camera, maybe to get more contrast or more grain or be able to shoot in lower light situations. As long as your camera's DX is able to read up to 1600, which is the case in most of them, you can do stuff like that. Or you can take your roll of Portra 400 and set the ISO to 200 to overexpose that film, maybe get more shadow detail and less green. So to modify the DX code on a roll of film, it's actually quite easy. All I would say is just look up DX code hack or modification. You'll find plenty of results on Google. I'll try and put one of those tables down in the description. All it is is a list of all the different codes and what they mean and which film speed they correspond to. All you need is usually a pair of scissors and a sharpie and it doesn't take too long. You can even use tape if you prefer and it's not a very sophisticated system so it's quite easy to override. So one thing about electronic point and shoot cameras is that they're reliant on batteries. I like to buy batteries in bulk amounts online to save a bit of money and always have spares. But make sure you're always buying good quality alkaline batteries for example if you can. Also if you're encountering some kind of error code on your camera or it's not turning on or you're just getting some kind of flashing light Sometimes it's as simple as just changing the battery for a fresh one. Another thing worth noting if you've bought a point and shoot camera secondhand is that corrosion on the battery terminals can be one of the most common problems. So if you open the battery cover and check for any sort of green or blue looking corrosion, which is a powdery buildup on the battery terminals, you can usually clean that off quite easily just by scraping it with a flathead screwdriver or something similar. However, make sure you never open up one of these and play around with the electronics inside if you don't know what you're doing. You can risk a pretty big electric shock from the capacitor for the flash that's inside these. So only do simple external touch-ups like I mentioned earlier. So when it comes to control with the point and shoot camera, 
Sometimes you don't have much of it, but there are some useful things you can do to try and make sure you have a higher keeper rate of good shots. And one of the first things that I would advise is to always make sure you have steady hands when you're using a point and shoot camera. The reason for that is that these will often have to use a low shutter speed due to the limited aperture in the lens. And my advice is also when you take a shot, make sure you stay still until you finish hearing the camera advance because you don't wanna move too early and result in a blurry shot. This especially applies if your camera has a zoom lens because point and shoot cameras with a zoom lens tend to have even smaller apertures, meaning they gather less light. So if you're using one of those and you have especially zoomed in to the long end of that lens, you need to make sure you're pretty steady unless it's extremely bright and or you have really high speed film. So don't be afraid to use a tripod with one of these if you need to. So another simple tip I have when it comes to using especially small point and shoot cameras is to keep your fingers away from the lens. For example, when I was new to using this particular camera, I found that I had a couple of shots where my finger was sort of over the lens, but I learned from that quickly and it's good to adopt a style of holding the camera that doesn't result in you putting your finger anywhere near the lens. So my next tip for point and shoot cameras is to use the flash when necessary. I personally don't like the look of flash when I can avoid it, but sometimes you do need to use it. And because of the limited light gathering ability I mentioned earlier with a point and shoot camera, you often need to use the flash as soon as the light starts to get a little low. So what I like to do, especially if it's indoor, nighttime, or getting late towards the evening, I like to take a shot with the flash and one without. Just in case the one without was blurry due to lack of light, I'll still have a backup shot with the flash. All right guys, so my next tip is to learn all the modes and features of your particular point and shoot camera. Sometimes these are loaded with features that we don't even know about or think about or bother using. It might have something like bulb mode for long exposures, spot metering, a macro focusing mode, different flash modes. So it's worth looking into all these to see what they do and make the most out of them. What I like to do is just look up a manual if you don't have a physical one. I often use a website called the Butkus Camera Manual Library that I mentioned in one of my previous videos. I'll put a link to that in the description below. But if you can't find the manual for your particular point and shoot camera, maybe find one for a similar camera by the same brand. More often than not, some of these features work the same across different camera models within the same brand. It's also getting easier to find great reviews on point and shoot cameras online, on forums, or even looking up YouTube reviews and videos. So get to know the features of your point and shoot camera, how they work so that you can make the most of them. So my final tip in this video relates to caring for your point and shoot camera. These things are more often than not made from plastic and they're quite fragile. So always use a wrist strap if it came with your camera. If it didn't come with one, consider getting one or maybe a neck strap so that you can look after it. I have dropped a point and shoot camera before, so I had to learn the hard way because it didn't survive the drop too well and not many will. Also, if you don't plan to use your point and shoot camera for maybe quite a few months, take the batteries out of it. That'll prolong the life of the batteries and also prevent corrosion happening to the terminals inside the camera. It's also worth keeping these things away from the elements, even though some of them, including this one, say weatherproof on them. Because they were made often in the 90s, the weather sealing and the rubber gaskets in the door have probably worn out a little bit. And even though they said weatherproof, you can't always rely on that to think that you can get the camera soaked. So if it does say weatherproof, it might be able to survive a bit of a splash, but still try and keep it away from heavy dust, rain, and sand, unless you've somehow tested the water sealing of the camera or it's actually designed for underwater use. For that reason, it's also worth keeping the camera clean around the lens and especially around the film chamber and the door. Whenever I load new film, I just like to sort of clean around the inside of the camera using a blower or a brush or both, which will improve any potential weather sealing and can prevent scratches happening on your film from a grain of sand dragging along the whole roll while you're shooting it. If your camera does happen to get wet and stops working or it's playing up, take the batteries out immediately. Sometimes the camera will work again once it's dried out and a way to speed that up is to do something like putting it in rice overnight. I, and I'm sure many other people have had success using that method, so it's actually worth a try. So 35 mil film point and shoot cameras can make some great images and it's worth trying to utilize them to their max potential. So don't be afraid to experiment with them and to even use some good film in there once you know that it's working. So that's about it for my point and shoot film camera tips. Make sure you've checked out the other videos on the channel. I hope you got something out of this and I'll see you on the next episode of Pushing Film.